Good morning, all of you. Can you hear me? Yes. Is the mic okay? Happy to be here and uh, happy to see all of you smiling. This morning, I thought I will speak to you on a topic which is of concern to all of us because we are all compulsive talkers and compulsive lecturers. And uh, an opportunity to meet with all of you could be through this forum. I thought I will speak to you about this topic of lecturing simply because we spend a lot of our time talking in classrooms, whether it's large classroom or small classroom. No matter what people may say, lectures have come to stay. And I've called this a vanishing art of lecturing because today everybody says, I don't need a teacher. I can get all that I want on my laptop, in my bedroom, at my convenience, in my comfort, at my own pace. I don't need the living, loving teacher. Why should I waste my time sitting in a class when I can get all that I want without attending the lecture? It is in that context I am <coughs> addressing you on this issue. It's not only an opportunity to share with you some thoughts on lecturing, it's also an opportunity for me to talk to you because instead of my <coughs> talking to you informally, I wanted to meet all of you at some point of time. So I thought you can uh, also interact with me. You can stop me anytime. Don't wait till the end of the lecture. You can always stop me. In, uh, also disagree with me. That's more important. When I hear somebody disagreeing, then I know you're thinking. If everybody keeps quiet, then I know that you're not thinking. So I call this the vanishing art simply because we have to reassess, we look at our status as teachers and lecturers when we address students in the classroom. I'll start with a quotation. When I give a lecture, I accept that people look at their watches. But what I do not tolerate is when they look at it and raise it to their ear to find out if it has stopped. <laughs> Very often this is the situation. The lecturer is not stopping. My watch also has stopped. This is the situation. Very often, this is what is prevalent in a classroom situation. People have had enough of lectures, and at the end of it, they are just fed up. They will run out of lectures. When you hear the word lecture, 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 what is the echo that you get? Torture, 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 torture. Lecture and torture are very close, and they sound very sim similar, and remember, Lecture is always painful. It is a torture, especially if you are at the wrong end of the lecture. Which is the wrong end of the lecture? You, where you are. <laughs> to receive the lecture is the most difficult thing. To give a lecture it is okay. You can enjoy it or you may not enjoy it. But the more painful and more difficult thing is to be at the wrong end of the lecture. It is like a doctor who suddenly one day, he has been a patient for a long time. A patient who has been having diabetes blood pressure, name it, all the diseases are there. Overnight he puts one board. I am doctor so and so. You won't believe him. Because he's been a patient. He says, I know everything about all these diseases. But you will not accept the fact that he is a doctor. Similar, But for students, till yesterday he is a student. He has been pumped with a lot of information. Overnight he gave him a degree and said, no, lecturer, assistant professor, no training required. When you talk of lecture, it is worth looking at lecture as a skill. Now, when you look at lecture, this is my definition. Uninterrupted, rambling exposition of apparently irrelevant, trivial information delivered in a sleep inducing monotone for one hour. <laughs> you took notes, but you didn't write this down. <laughs> Very often, this is what happens. We will say, when you take the lecture, don't interrupt me, because if you interrupt me, I will not be able to get my continuity of thought. So don't interrupt me till the end of the lecture. Or the end will not come. That's a different issue. <laughs> but uninterrupted, rambling exposition of apparently irrelevant, trivial information. What do we do when we go to give a lecture? Very often, we will pick up things which are out of the way, which is in fine print, not easily accessible to students, because you don't want to give fundamental things, because you feel Fundamental things, anyway, they are supposed to know. I will not tell them. So you don't talk foundational things. You don't talk anything very basic. You will talk all trivial things because you want to impress. You want to impress them that you know. Very often, lecturing is giving an impression of performance. 
you want to impress them, I know this much. I have a big head. Head in the sense, a lot of knowledge. So you want to show your knowledge. So very often it's a show off in a lecture situation. Because you want to show off your knowledge, so you very often concentrate on irrelevant, trivial information to impress, and you often deliver it in a sleep-inducing monotone, usually in the afternoon, when they are already, their stomachs are full, that's the time you deliver. Naturally, this is of course a bad definition of that. I just gave it to you, just to provoke, just to think, make you think about a lecture, what it has hap happened to be to it. Now, when you look back at all the teachers who taught you, look back from the time you were in school, till you have come to the stage where, even today when you are listening to lectures, you can broadly classify them into one of three categories. The first type of teacher is whom I call as the confusion master. <laughs> obfuscator, I used a big word, obfuscator. I will leave this presentation here. If any of you want, you are welcome to take it. I have nothing. This is not, uh, I would like you to share it. So you don't feel compelled to write down. You are welcome to use this, take this presentation. The first type of teacher is confusion master or obfuscator. The teacher's intentions are good. Erudite scholar, very well read. But when he or she spoke, he confused you. And then when you read, hey, it's such a simple thing. This man confused us thoroughly. <laughs> now, remember, he didn't intend to confuse, but his communication skills or his ability to convey convincingly was not there. So in the process, he confused you. You should not be like this. Very often, we have these type of teachers, obfuscators, because there's so much of information, they don't know how to give it. They put it in such a way that the whole thing is a mess. The second type of teacher whom I call as the regurgitator, a talking textbook. Everything in the book is faithfully reproduced. <laughs> Sometimes he's a walking textbook, but very often he's a talking, he's only a talking textbook. Very often they won't move. They'll stand rooted behind the lectern or they'll stand like that and then go on talking. Everything in the book is very faithfully reproduced. Here again you feel cheated. Why should I waste my time? Why should I come here and sit when everything that he's saying is in the book? Regurgitator. Again, no role. He also failed. That's why lecture is now losing its place because very often we deal with obfuscators and regurgitators. The real value of a lecture comes from a facilitator. A person who facilitates learning, who can create that atmosphere that there is something I can learn from the lecture by attending the lecture. I will miss something if I don't go for this live theater performance. That is a facilitator. All our good teachers, so-called teachers who inspired you are people who are facilitators of learning who might not have said everything, but at least the way they put it across, the way they dealt with you, they, the way they convinced you, they were facilitators of learning in some way or the other. So my effort is primarily to share with you what is it that goes into facilitation of learning? How in a large classroom or a small classroom, how do we facilitate learning? <coughs> That's why I call this the vanishing art of lecturing. I hope it will not vanish. It will never vanish, no matter what people may say. I'm going to look at it under three headings. One is lecture algebra. Third, the second is indications. For everything, there are indications, contraindications. You do things because there are indications. You should not also not do. And then, of course, the method of lecturing. So this will be my approach. My the land that lies ahead will be basically revolving around these three: lecture algebra, indications, and method. I'll start with lecture algebra. Now, lecture algebra means painful lecture, like my algebra. Arthralgia, have you heard of that? Arthralgia means joint pain. Myalgia means muscle pain. Lecturalgia means <laughs> pain. For whom is it painful? Usually for the people who are receiving it. Usually it is. Sometimes it is pain for the person who has to give also. You'll say, oh, I will give a lecture. But by and large, most of the time it is painful for the person who's receiving it. That's why I say lecture is a torture. This has been defined. It's not a term I have used. It has appeared in the literature. And it is described as a disease or a syndrome. Syndrome means some symptoms and signs experienced by members of lecture to audience. You inflict a lecture, continuously inflict a lecture, they will suffer. What do they suffer from? They will suffer from certain characteristics. One is heightened emotions, agitation, frustration, and anger. You cannot express it because some risk is involved. If you start expressing this because that person may be senior, he may be your examiner, there is some risk involved. So you cannot express heightened emotions. Often you are not able to express, even though it may be there. If they can take the risk, they will do that. Some students may do that. They will take the risk and express their anger or frustration because they are fed up with the lectures. Then comes suppressed emotions. Very common. Very common. 
one is apathy, total lack of interest. If you have to come, either for attendance requirement or for some obligation, somebody has asked me to come, okay, I'll come and sit. Apathy, a thing comes out of lectures. People only come out of lectures. A thing comes out of lectures. This is the feeling. And in the process, what happens is, you are totally disinterested, very skeptical, nothing comes out of lecturing. Then comes the most common effect of lecturing, sleep. <laughs> you call it somnolence. You don't need drugs, you don't need barbiturates, you don't need any drugs. You give a lecture, people will fall asleep. <laughs> Best sedative. Best sedative, nothing is required. The most effective sedative is lecture. I remember one uh, first standard boy, he was sitting in class and the teacher was talking about the virtues of being a mother. Mother is the most wonderful creation in this world. Nothing can replace the mother, 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 mother and the teacher was talking all glory about the mother. And then the teacher asked one question to the class. In this world, who is better or who is greater? Teacher or mother? And immediately, yes, like you, one person, one student said, teacher, this teach, class teacher was upset. You are saying teacher is, I am telling you the virtues of being a mother and you are telling teacher is better. Why? And this boy said, in my home, I have a little brother. To pull, put that fellow to sleep, my mother has to dance, sing, do so many things. The fellow will not fall asleep at all. Whereas you, when you come and stand, everybody in one minute, everybody is asleep. Now, this is what happens. That's why we say a teacher is more effective because you get in one minute, everybody is asleep. So I consider you greater than the mother. So, that's why I say somnolence. Nothing can put people to sleep as a lecture. Yeah. You don't need drugs. Pharmacologists, people who deal with drugs, just as a Mahenda lecture will fall asleep. So, remember this. Having said that, we must ask why we cause lecture idea. Why is it that some lectures you are able to be awake, but most of the time you fall asleep because lecture objectives are not clear. Why is it that I am speaking to you about something? We often don't tell our students why is it important for them to know this either for their life or for their profession or for their practice, whatever. If you only tell them you're going to pass the exam, it's okay. That is not the purpose. You must tell them why, if you know this or you uh, learn about this, it will help you. We never ever make our lecture objectives clear. Second, we often have so much information, we give it in a disorganized way. We never give it in a capsule form. We never give it in a tablet form. We never give it in a syrup. When you take a medicine, you want it a syrup or tablet or capsule. When you give a lecture, you simply dump the information. And the poor fellow, he can't grasp even the basics. So it's often disorganized. Very often we as teachers make this big mistake. Too much, too fast. We simply deliver information at breakneck speed and the person cannot absorb. He will alone get it inside, he cannot understand anything at all. We give too much, too fast. These are the causes of lecture. <coughs> and then of course, we don't relate or respond to audience needs. What I mean is, we often teach the subject we don't teach our students. I repeat that. We teach the subject, we don't teach our students. Meaning, we are so concerned about teaching our subject, we forget that people listening to you are human beings who have not even understood some fundamental facts. We have no concern, we have no care. Basically it means we have no concern and care. When these things happen, the lecture becomes a cause of lecture algae. Then the question comes, why lecture? If lecture has got so many disadvantages, why do we lecture? First, lecture so that you inspire. Second, to influence. Third and only third, inform. Unfortunately, most of the time, when we lecture, we try to inform first, influence rarely, inspire never. Never. And that's why people lose faith in lectures. Because they say, nothing comes out of lectures. It's a total waste of time. And this is the situation that prevails. Inform last. Inspire first, influence second. Influence in the sense, learn more about it, go read about it, kindle that interest, inspiration. So if the good teachers have left an impact on you with your hearts thumping, they are people who have inspired you. You might not remember what they said, but you remember how they did it. These are the great teachers who have had an impact on you. Inspire first, influence second, inform third. Very often problems arise because you invert this. You want to inform first. And information giving becomes the primary objective of lecturing. Then you have faith. So keep this in mind. If you can't do this, don't lecture. You can do any other method. Mic is not working.
Now, what makes a lecture effective? In my assessment, a lecture becomes effective when you have the content knowledge, that is expertise. You are able to engage or involve the audience. Lecture doesn't mean, though it is the most passive of the methods of instruction, it must have some element of involvement. Engage the audience. Explaining ability. Lecturing is not telling. Today, people simply stand and read the PowerPoint. You simply tell. Lecturing is not telling. Lecturing is the ability to explain. Enthusiasm. If you are not enthusiastic about your subject, how do you expect your students to be enthusiastic? Very often, we see no enthusiasm in the teacher. I have to do it out of my duty or obligation, and in the process, you don't convey any enthusiasm. And the last thing is, you have to kindle the interest. You have to evoke interest. I consider these five as the cardinal principles of effective lecture. Now I'll go ahead and explain to you, discuss with you, what is the definition of a lecture, what are the myths or misconceptions, and third, what are the guidelines. I think the mic is not working. I'm OK. I don't need the mic. Let's look at the definition of a lecture. By definition, not the definition I gave you earlier, which you did not want to take down. This also you need not, but I'm just showing you a diagram. It's a discourse on a subject where the T stands for teacher, reaches out to a large number of students. The advantage of a lecture is you can have large number of students and one teacher. No other method of instruction will require only one teacher for large number of students. If you have seminar or tutorial or anything else, you will require four teachers, five teachers for every session, meaning for every 15 students you'll have a teacher, or for every 10 students you'll have a teacher. That is required, whereas for this one, lecture, even if you have 200 students, one, two, this morning we saw, when you had 200 people, one teacher is enough. So it is easy and convenient form of delivery. One teacher reaching out to a large, provided you take some Okay. What are the misconceptions about lecturing? The first misconception about lecturing is covering information is teaching. We often think covering information is teaching. In army, yes, covering the ground is possible. But in lecture, let us not try to cover everything. Covering information is not to be equated with teaching. Very many times teachers make this mistake of trying to cover everything. It is in uncovering the excitement is, not in covering. Unfortunately, we try to cover everything. And when you cover everything, there is no excitement. So let the students know, I am not here to cover everything. So covering information is not to be equated with teaching. Second, speech making is often equated with instruction. Meaning, when you give a speech, this is the politician who gives a speech. He's not concerned whether people are coming in, people are going out, people are daydreaming. They're not worried. When you are instructing, when you are a teacher in a classroom, you are vitally concerned I want my students to be with me. At least you must understand something of what I speak. So speech making is not to be equated with instruction. No questions means understanding. At the end of 60 minutes of a lecture, you ask, any questions? Will anybody dare ask a question? <laughs> because you will start your lecture again. And you can imagine, one person has asked a question at the end of 60 minutes, and you have started your lecture. What will happen to that person after 60 minutes? When you leave the class, everybody will pounce on him and say, don't ever ask a question again. If you have anything, go and meet them privately. Don't, add, don't ruin our lunch time, our break time, all our. This is what happens. So no questions does not mean understanding. No questions means, we had enough of you. Please go. That is the message. You have to be humble enough to accept that fact that when people keep quiet, you had en they had enough of you, please go. So no questions does not mean understanding. Please group reaction, anonymous feedback. You give feedback forms at the end of five or 10 lectures. It's customary for us to do. Our students are very kind. No matter what you do, whatever you inflict on them, they will write good things only about you because they don't want to take any risk because they know your handwriting. He knows your handwriting. You know his handwriting. So they are afraid. That is one. Secondly, they are very kind. Our students are very kind. No matter what you do to them, they will write good things. So please group reaction simply means you have been nice to them or kind to them. Or they have been kind to you. It doesn't mean learning has taken place. So don't equate please group reaction to learning. And the next myth is we often equate academic success to teaching skill. Meaning, when you want to appoint a teacher, whom do you appoint? The topmost student of the class, gold medalist, who has got 10 publications, so many research papers. Fellow cannot teach for nuts. 
He cannot communicate. The obfuscators all come in that category. I'm not saying being brilliant doesn't make you a good teacher. I'm just saying you can have. I had a classmate of mine, Pandya. First in all subjects. Every year he used to be first. Today he has become a professor. But when he speaks, nobody understands. <laughs> I tell Pandian, what Pandian? You are, I can't understand what you are talking. You are not at my level. You are in some other world. Because what you speak, I can't understand. Because he's at that level. So we often equate academic success with teaching skill. When you want to appoint a faculty, our criteria for selection are not based on teaching skill. Our criteria of selection is how well you have been a student. And that is what I mean by saying, academic success is often equated teaching skill means we believe somebody who had good intellectual achievement may have pedagogic ability, which may not be. May not be. Which means we have said the best learner is often the best teacher, which is not. It may so happen, it's luck, if the best student becomes the best teacher. But very often we have observed the topmost student in a class is not necessarily the best teacher. That doesn't mean you go and appoint somebody who has failed several times. But I would think that is better because he'll understand all the problems. He will, actually, I would really think a person who has failed several times is a much better, compassionate, considerate uh, teacher because he will really know what the problems of students are. Like that to me. Patient yeah. becoming the doctor. Pardon? Patient becoming the doctor. Exactly. Exactly. I really feel that I want you to be aware. I am not saying this is the solution, but I am just suggesting. When you select a teacher, look at that component as well. Otherwise, you'll have people who are at that level in a totally different atmosphere. They will not be able to reach out. And then you teach the subject, and you don't teach the student. So these are myths. So how many misconceptions? Do you recall any one of these? Any one? Any one? We have seen four or five myths. Any one you recall? Any one? Public yeah, public speaking is not instruction. Anything else? But please group reaction doesn't mean Learning has no question. No questions no question. does not mean a no question means we had enough of you. Please go. Lecture is boring. Huh? Lecture is boring. Yeah. Lecture is boring. Yeah. Lecture. Yeah. Very often, in principle, basically, lecture, torture, boring, all these things go together. Covering. Covering information is not. We teach the subject and not the students. Yeah. We often teach the subject and not the students. I prepared the ground for giving the guidelines. What I gave as misconceptions, what I gave as myths, will now prepare the ground for now giving simple, <coughs> applicable guidelines, which tomorrow when you have to give a lecture, you can apply. The first guideline is this. Don't be complete, which is actually what I said before. Don't cover everything. Don't try to cover everything. I had a professor who used to say, what is not covered in the class will be covered in the examination. <laughs> <laughs> It is very true, I tell you. No, and she was very, very particular. She said that once. We all laughed like this. Again, she came and said, then we laughed. And after that, we thought, what? This lady is mad. What she did, she was very smart. She said, this is the book I am recommending. She, there is a recommended book in our subject. So said, this is the book I am recommending. I expect that you will read this book. I am accountable. You are accountable for what is in this book. In my class, I will give you an overview of the topic. I will guide you to read the book. And she ensured that when she gave the question, the first exam, when she gave questions came from the book. She had not mentioned anything about it in the class. We were shocked. And I, she said, I told you what is not covered. Because this is the book. This is the gold standard. I am not here to tell you everything. I am here to give you my perspective. I will give you an overview. I'll simplify concepts which need to be simplified. But you must do the reading. You must do the walking. That we must let our students know. I am not here to tell you everything. Somehow students feel, if it's not told in the class, it should not be assessed. No. For that, one requirement is there. You must identify one standard book. You can't say there is no standard book. One standard book you identify in your subject and say, this is the book, this is the gold standard. And I will teach from outside or whatever. I might give you my perspective. But this is the book I expect you to read. And my questions will come not only from what I speak, but also from what, what is in the book. First guideline, simple guideline. Let the students know I'm not here to tell you everything. Provided you let them know this is a book from which we will expect you to know. Let them read the book. Inculcate that habit of reading a book. Otherwise, they'll depend only on lectures. So the first guideline is actually a link to what I said earlier. Don't try to cover everything. And let the students know that. The second guideline is don't mention anything once. If something is important, repeat. If something is important, reinforce. I had a professor who was talking about 
I just give you an example in medicine, simple example. Mitral stenosis. There is a valve in the heart called mitral valve. That valve can get stenosed. So he <coughs> came to class one day and said, what are the causes of mitral stenosis? Give me five causes. First cause, rheumatic carditis. Second cause, rheumatic carditis. Third cause, rheumatic carditis. Fourth cause, rheumatic carditis. Fifth cause, rheumatic carditis. What is he saying? We were wondering what, something went wrong with him. He's stammering or something, same thing. He said, no, I'm telling you, most of the time in this country, the cause of mitral stenosis is rheumatic carditis, 99.99% of the time. There are five or six other causes. I don't care if you don't remember them. Remember, it is important that you just remember this one cause. I will repeat this five times rather than all the causes once. Very often if there is a list, very often what we do is we'll give the full list and don't tell them which is important. If that list contains two that are very important, repeat those two three times. Rather than telling all, the list is there in the book, they can go and read. Your effort as a teacher, as a lecturer, is to emphasize and reinforce what is important, maybe two times or three times. And that is the second guideline. If something is important, worth, it is worth repeating. And that comes with this quote. Tell them what you're going to say, say it, and tell them what you have said. If you are more skillful, you will say, ask them what you have said. Tell them what you are going to say, say it. Ask them what you have said. How many myths we saw? What did they do? We saw some myths. So then some of you told me the myths. So ask them what you have said. So that is the second guideline. So how many guidelines we saw now? Two guidelines. One is don't be complete. Second is don't mention anything once. Simple. I'm telling everything as don't, don't. You may wonder why. Why, are I, why am I giving you, instead of being positive, I'm giving negative. In this world, we are all tuned to this don't. No parking. You go there and say no parking. They'll never say yes parking. Have you ever seen a word yes parking? <laughs> never. Always say don't do this, don't do that. There was a boy who went to class and uh, the teacher asked, what is your name? He said, my name is Johnny Don't. <laughs> what? The teacher said, Johnny Don't? Yeah. When I am in the house, when I go this side, my mother will say, Johnny Don't. If I go this side, my mother will say, Johnny Don't. If I go this way, if I do something, say Johnny don't. So this fellow thinks his name is Johnny don't. So we are all living in the Johnny don't era. Everything don't, don't, no parking, don't go there, don't do this, uh, entry with the restriction, everything. He never give anything positive. So that's why I'm also presenting lecture guidelines as don't. That way we might probably register things. Don't do this. If you don't do certain things, automatically what will happen will be an effective lecture. Third one is don't restate, create. That is don't regurgitate. Again, extension of what I told you. Don't become regurgitators. To explain this, I'll give you an example from my own life. I was a first year clinical student. I was in Stanley Medical College, and my professor, Jayanti Ramarao. Jayanti Ramarao is a man. That's the first thing I must tell you. I don't know why he was called uh, so, but his parents called him Jayanti Ramarao. Now, Jayanti Ramarao was my professor, and he brought one patient. This patient had a back problem. And this patient was brought and put on the couch. There was a small couch there, and the patient was put there. And we were medical students, so he said, all of you stand back. Then he said, all of you look at me. Me means Jainti Ramarao. And Jainti Ramarao said, all of you stand back, now watch me. When the British ruled India, they were lords. We laughed. This is buffoon. What is he doing? This professor. He said, please watch me carefully. When the British ruled India, they were lords. Then he went to the board. He went to the board and said, backward bending of the spine. He wrote this word, lordosis. Lordosis is backward bending of the spine. <coughs> Then he made that patient walk. He made the patient walk. Patient had a back problem. So he walked. He had a back problem, so he walked. Like this. He said, this patient is not a lord, but he has lordosis. When the British ruled India, they were lords, but they had no lordosis. <laughs> that is how we introduced the concept of a back deformity. If it had been conventional teaching, they would have said, there are three types of back deformities. Lordosis, kyphosis, scoliosis. Scoliosis is sideward bending. Kyphosis, scoliosis sideward, kyphosis forward, lordosis backward. Ultimately, you're confused. Which is which? Which is kyphosis? Which is scoliosis? Now, what I'm trying to say is, 
creativity. Jayanti Ramarao need not have done this. Jayanti Ramarao could have simply said, Kai Bosu, scoliosis and confused everybody and the patient and nobody knows what is happening. He created that drama, that amount of liveliness in his presentation that suddenly we awoke. We had laughter at that time, but in that laughter there was learning. That is creativity. He need not have done it, but today he is dead and gone. Jayanti Ramarao is dead and gone, but he lives in me forever. That is Jayanti Ramarao. I am just giving an example of what it is to be creative. Creativity for a teacher often comes when you start thinking about how best you can present it to a student so that he or she will remember. If you have that concern and care and love for your students, you will always keep thinking. And the best ideas don't come when you are actually preparing. The best ideas will come when you are driving a car, or you are taking a shower, or you are walking. You just think about how best I can put it across so that somebody will remember. Jayanti Ramarao did that. And that is what I mean by saying, don't regurgitate or don't restate, create. You may not be able to create everything every time, but at least some important concepts, some ideas, you can create. To understand creativity, I'm now going to explain what is creativity. When we present information, you may present useful information, you may not present useful information. This is the horizontal axis. I call this the utility axis. Useful information in a lecture, not useful information in a lecture. Then you have the vertical axis, where presented in an interesting way, like Jayanti Ramarao, presented in such a way that people laughed, but in that laughter there was learning. Presented in a most boring way. Large number of teachers presented in a most boring way. Lot of information, but presented boom. That is the novelty axis. Combine the four, and then you'll get four quadrants. The first one, for want of any other, pardon me for using that word, the old goat. Maybe young goat also, but <laughs> no useful information. Nothing interesting. Actually, he has no place. He simply has no place. Uh, I forget, I'll not talk about this because there's simply no use. Uh, just no useful information, nothing interesting. A large number of our teachers come in this category. Pedantic bore. Lot of information presented in the most boring way. People say bore, torture. All these things come because lot of information is presented and the people are simply not able to digest. If only these teachers, they're all erudite scholars, very well read, but when they spoke, they spoke in such a way. So much information came at breakneck speed, they are simply not able to convey in an easy, assimilable form. Then comes a charlatan. He's a dangerous fellow. Trickster, mesmerizer. He will do all circus and drama, no subject. <laughs> this is very dangerous. You want to cover up your lack of subject with all the drama and gimmicks. More dangerous than the other two. I would consider him more dangerous than the other two. The charlatan, the trickster, the mesmerizer. Who, he'll do, he did a lot of stuff, but subject, no subject. This is dangerous, but the real creative teacher is one who combines useful information with interest. Makes it lively. Jayanti Ramarao. I just give one example. There are several other examples, but I'm just showing you what it is to be creative. Creative simply means that effort on your part to make it live, a live theater performance, more than an audio cassette, more than a video cassette. Very often we see students saying, oh, handout is there, no, I did not come for the lecture. PowerPoint presentation is there, no, you give it to me. The student must get a feeling I am missing something if I don't attend the lecture. He cannot get it through a handout, he cannot get it through a PowerPoint, he cannot get it through a video cassette. He must get the feeling I have missed a live theater performance. Then only you make lectures meaningful. Creativity is that skill. If you can do that, I know you cannot do it for every little thing, but if you can bring that life into a lecture, you have achieved what a lecture should be. So we have seen, first guideline, don't be complete. Second is, don't mention anything once. Simple guidelines. All this you know, I'm only giving a structure. Third one, don't restate, create. Wherever possible, bring it to life. Next one is, don't confess, profess. You are a professor, that means you profess something. You believe in something. If you stand here and say, the topic I'm taking today is a very difficult topic. <laughs> Nobody understands much about the topic. It's very abstract. Even though I speak about this topic, you will not understand anything. Even if you write anything, we don't know what is right and what is wrong. You may not get marks because we don't know what is right and what is wrong. But still, you'll have to write because it is there in your syllabus. This is expected of you. It's a very difficult topic, but still, I will try. I'll try my best. 
to explain to you, even though much has been written about it, little is known about it. Now, if I, if I stand here, a professor on the subject, expert, is saying, very difficult topic, I didn't understand, I found it difficult. You students are looking at me, professor, doesn't know anything, me, poor fellow, I don't know anything, finished. When you confess, stand and confess, I don't know anything, very abstract, very difficult, this is there is that. When you present something, present it with authority, aplomb, as if that's the most important thing in the world. If you are not enthusiastic, if you are not convinced, how will you enthuse someone? How will you convince someone? How will you inspire someone? You must speak as if what I'm speaking today is the most important thing in the world. If I stand here and say, lecture has been in practice over several centuries in different institutions, management institutions, health science institutions, engineering institutions, lecturing as a skill, nothing much comes out of lecturing. If I start talking like this, you will not only not come here, you will run away. Next time you know that I am coming here, you will disappear from this pl place so that you are nowhere. You will take leave also so that you will not come back. Now if I start and say lecture is like this and I don't give you a visible live performance of a lecture which can be effective, then you are not going to be convinced. So basically it is that. Don't confess, profess. Simply mean whatever you know, you convey with gusto, with all the authority, with all the enthusiasm. If you are not enthusiastic about your subject, how can you ever make your students enthusiastic? They lose interest. We have, in our own lives, we have seen people. We are inspired by somebody because he is so committed. He is so enthusiastic about it. He believes in it. He is so involved. And that is what I mean by saying, don't confess, profess. Don't extemporize, organize. We all have fund of knowledge, plenty of information. Our problem is to put it across in a capsule form, to put it as a tablet, to present it as a syrup. That is the most difficult thing. To give the short lecture is more difficult. Woodrow Wilson, one of the former presidents of the United States, was asked to give a speech. He was asked to give a lecture. They asked him to give a lecture. And Woodrow Wilson said, how long do you want me to speak? If you want me to speak for five minutes, give me one month time. If you want me to speak for 15 minutes, give me 15 days' time. If you want me to speak endlessly, I'm ready. <laughs> we teachers are like that. We are ready to speak, God speaking. The most difficult thing for us to do is to keep quiet. The most difficult thing for a teacher to do, I was just telling at tea time, the most difficult thing for us to do is to keep quiet. And to speak less. What can be said in five minutes? It is much more difficult to get things done in five minutes. That's why presentations, wherever, whenever you go for a grant or anything, they'll ask you to present in five minutes what you want to present. If you can't do it in five minutes, you may speak for one hour. Nothing much can happen. So what I'm trying to say is spend your time on how you are going to present, how you are going to speak, rather than what. The what is already there in your head. Spend your time how you can package it and present it. Don't extemporize, organize. So we have seen how many guidelines now? Very often, yeah. Yes. The other thing is, in a lecture, especially when you have a 60-minute lecture, you have to break the monotony. Breaking the monotony means giving pauses, giving intermissions. Even when you watch a cricket match or watch a serial, there are intermissions. Suddenly, they'll put one thing. When you don't want it to come, doing it will come. And then you are wondering, what is this? But at this time only, he wants to bring. In a lecture too, you must bring some breaks. If you don't put a break, people will fall asleep. Like all these electrical apparatus, you put it on for some time. After some time, it will go off. Because the fuse goes up. Similarly, human mind is like that. After 20 minutes, it will simply go off. It will go off to the city. It will go off to all other places. And your mind will be wandering. You have to break the monotony. One way you could do it is, just 15 or 20 minutes through the lecture, ask somebody, can you recall one point? One thing that you have written, one idea, one thought, one concept, one phrase, anything that you remember so far that I've told, can you remember one word? Even if you can't remember, look what you've written, one word can you read? Break the monotony. Breaking the monotony is key. If you are giving a lecture, because lecture is the most passive of the methods of instruction, you must make a very conscious effort to break the monotony. Maybe 15 minutes. Every 15 minutes or every 20 uh, minutes, at least two or three intermissions must be there so that you just break the monotony. Do you have a system of taking attendance? I'm just asking. Yes. Yes. Is it there? When do you take attendance? <coughs> Usually beginning or end. My suggestion is why don't you take attendance midway through the session? 
advantage is you're breaking the monotony. And tell them, class is not over. I'm going to come back. But while I take attendance, share your notes, catch up on what you missed, see your friend's notes, let there be some swapping of notes, some noise, some healthy noise. Try taking attendance with way. Get them used to that. Because the first and the end of the class are the best times. People are most attentive in the beginning and most attentive in the end. Because class is going to end, they are very attentive. <laughs> beginning, people are very fresh. And we waste our time either taking attendance at that time or doing some totally inconsequential things. So that is the time that you need. Put that break in the middle. Just a suggestion. You can try it out. There's a book, actually, 53 Interesting Things to Do in a Lecture. It's, uh, I have that reference. I'll send it to you. That uh, by Hedshaw, H-A-B-E-S-H-A-W. 53 interesting things to do in the lecture. But don't do all the 53 in one hour. <laughs> <laughs> then you cannot do anything else. <laughs> so one or two you can select. But uh, I have a summary of that article, uh, which I can send it to you. But it just gives you an idea how to break the monotony in a lecture. So we have seen simple guidelines. First is don't be complete. Don't tell everything. It is not possible. Let the students know I'm not here to tell everything. Second is don't mention anything once. If something is important, repeat. If something is to be forgotten, tell only once. And then you can go back and say, I told you once, no. They'll say, yes, I've really forgotten. <laughs> if something is to be forgotten, you can tell once. Which means you don't have to tell at all. It's as good as not telling. So if something is important, worth repeating. What am I doing now? <laughs> yes, I will drill it into your drill. You will never forget this. You'll curse me. Why this? What does he think? We are army duds. But I want you to remember. No matter what you think, I want you to remember this. So I will repeat whether you like it or not. This is, don't mention anything once. Don't restate, create. Jayanti Ramarao. If something can be presented in an interesting way, let people laugh at you. Doesn't matter. But in that laughter, there will be learning. They will remember you much later, because some of those concepts you will remember forever. Don't confess, profess, be enthusiastic. Whatever you do, show that enthusiasm. It should be infectious. Enthusiasm should, yes, Go to the rest of the people so that <coughs> somebody whom you inspire. This is basically about inspiration. Don't extemporize or spend your time on how you're going to present, not so much on what. What is okay? You already have the expertise, you have the experience. But can you present it in an easily assimilable form? Don't give a monologue, break the monotony. Simple six guidelines which you can implement. I am not telling you anything which you did not know. I only gave it a structure and a shape, which you can implement tomorrow. Tomorrow when you have to give a lecture, these are simple guidelines which you can. And the last one, which I have not shown, which I'm going to show, is very critical, very important. And that is, don't exceed the time. <laughs> very important. You must do what Sunil Gavaskar did. You know what Sunil Gavaskar, Sunil Gavaskar was India's opening batsman? Wonderful batsman. Uh, leading uh, India's opening, uh, you know, batsman, uh, as a batsman, he was uh, wonderful. Suddenly one morning he said, I am retired. Huh? People said, you, retiring, Sunil Gavaskar, retiring. No, you can open India's opening, uh, bats, uh, open India's batting for another two years. He said, no, I've retired. People ask, why are you retiring? Not, why are you not retiring? <laughs> In a similar situation, leave the class when people ask, why you are going, not, why are you not going? They start shuffling their feet, looking at the watch. This one is not, that fellow is not shopping, this also is not shopping. This is the situation. Let us leave the class when people ask why. They should be asking for more. Leave at the time when people ask why not, why not. We often come to that stage of why not. People are restless. Just when it is lunchtime, you say, no, no, wait, wait, five minutes. Just five more points. Then you go to fifth gear. Then you go and pump one other five or six points. Nobody will understand anything because they are interested in just rushing out of the class. This is the situation. So never exceed the time. Anyway, you're not going to cover everything. You only cover what is possible in the time that is available. Tell them this is the book. You read the book. In the time that is available, what you want to cover, you cover in a way that is interesting and lively. Ultimately, now my definition comes. My definition of a lecture is one which is lively, which means there is enthusiasm in it. It has got information, it is educative, it is creative, it is novel, it is thought-provoking, it will kindle some interest, make you read something, make you learn something more about it. It is understood, you are teaching the students, not the subject. You are at the same wavelength, not like Pandya. You are at the wavelength with the students. I am with you, are you with me? 
make it relevant. Why am I speaking to you about it? Most important, there is a theater element. It's so appropriate that you have here, in this very campus, something close to theater, film, theater, media. It is so important. I believe a live theater performance has got that component. I'm not saying that you should be acting all the time, but at least there is an element. You have seen people who are so absolutely lifeless when they give lectures. And what do they inspire? Nothing. So there is an element of enjoyment in theater, in lecture. If a lecture has to be effective, there is an element of enjoyment. So that the student feels, I have missed something. Ultimately, it is this. We often say power corrupts. Have you heard of this power corrupts? I tell you, PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Today, nothing has corrupted our lecture system than PowerPoint. We have killed more people by PowerPoint. We simply stand, project the PowerPoint, and read what is in the PowerPoint. If there is no PowerPoint, if there is no power, there is no PowerPoint. When there is no PowerPoint, there is no lecture. You cancel the lecture. This is the situation. We have become so dependent on the PowerPoint, we cannot lecture without a PowerPoint. Nothing has corrupted the practice of lecturing as PowerPoint today. And there's an article, I'm not creating this. We have seen an article, death by PowerPoint. We have killed most people, most of the students run away from lectures because they are fed up PowerPoint, go on reading and then they say, okay, you send me that as attachment or something like that. There is simply no involvement. Remember, it is not the PowerPoint that will make the day. The best visual aid is not the PowerPoint. The best visual aid is the teacher. The living, loving teacher. If you can't deliver, the PowerPoint cannot. You cannot take refuge behind the PowerPoint. You cannot take refuge behind any visual aid. The best visual aid is you, the teacher. Nothing can replace you. PowerPoint is an aid. Unfortunately, we have become so dependent on the PowerPoint, we simply project everything on the PowerPoint and read the PowerPoint. We often read the slide. We never discuss or talk about the slide. The ideas must be there, you must talk about it. Unfortunately, we simply read the PowerPoint, and there we have been. I want to remind you, what are the things you should not do? One is, don't annoy people with your presentation. Don't bore people, don't confuse, don't distract, and don't exhaust. Annoy me, don't irritate people, don't bore them, don't torture them, don't confuse them. When you have too much fact, you will tend to confuse. So make sure what you're going to speak. Distract them with mannerisms or anything that might probably take you away, take them away from the message and don't tell everything. I'm going to conclude with an experiment, an experiment which will capture all that I have told you. Please may I have this slide. It is about the lecture and its impact on students. I'm going to start with a student represented as a reagent bottle. Narrow neck, nothing comes out of lecturing. Anyway, I have to go, so he is waiting. For the lecture, you are waiting. And you are going, you are the teacher. Teacher is going to give lecture. This is the teacher, I am showing this as the beaker. Some of you have seen this in the laboratories, you have seen beaker. So this is the teacher. Teacher is going to give a lecture to the student. So teacher, this is the student. This is the information. So much information is there in the library. So much. So you have been told, don't cover everything, don't be complete. So you decide, okay, now for this student, for this level, I can only teach this much. So you this much I cannot, there is so much information, anyway I can't teach all that. So you fill yourself with information and go and give a lecture. <laughs> <laughs> what happened? <coughs> what is the problem here? Nothing went inside. What is the problem? Why you didn't go inside? Why? <laughs> it is just, ah, <coughs> lid opener, I had not opened the lid. What is meant by lid opener in a lecture? Opening the mind. How do you open the mind of a student? They are coming after so many experiences. You have taken a lecture four days ago. And they are coming. So many things have happened. So many other subjects. So many other experiences. They come back. They are having so many things in their mind. How do you open the mind so that they become receptive? What is meant by lid opener? Recap. Recap. Wonderful. Recap. Day. Making the relevance. Pardon? You can empty out. That's okay. But I want... Opening the lid, lid opener in a lecture simply means preparing the ground, making them more receptive. Tell them why this is important, how it is going to help you in your uh, life or whatever. We never ever spend some time explaining. I still remember my class, my first class on ECG. You know what ECG is. 
my teacher came to class, I was a first year student, the teacher came and said, E C G P Q R. She went down writing on the board. I was thinking, what? I'm going to become a doctor. And E, what is P? What is Q? I didn't know what is P Q. She didn't spend two minutes telling what is E C G, why E C G is important. She could have just spent that three minutes telling what is the importance of an E C G when somebody has a heart attack. You do an electrical recording. Some that was not. At the end of the day, when I went, I realized what I missed because it didn't make any sense to me. My mind was not open at all. After that, I switched off because I was wondering, what is this P, Q, R, some waves? It doesn't make any sense to me. So lid opener simply means making the mind. Students are coming after so many experiences. They are coming after several other classes. Bring them back. Bring them to focus. That is the first step. So what you do is you open the lid, and then you fill yourself with information and dump the information. Now what happens? <laughs> I opened the lid. Now what happens? No. Yeah, went out. Why, what, what is, you said I didn't open the lid. Now, a little better than last time, but something has gone in. But not as bad as last time. But what is the problem here? For it slowly. For it slowly, with concern. If you have love for your students, if you have concern and care, if you want to teach the students, not the subject, then with love, with care, with concern, little by little, you will adopt this information. And check. Are you with me? How many points I told you? What are the guidelines? With concern, with care, little by little, are you with me? But very often, what do we do? We have no concern and care. When you have a child at home, when you want to feed a one-year-old child at home, what do you do? You will sing, you will dance, the child will be looking here, and that time one spoon you will give. And the child doesn't know the child is eating. Nobody, you just put the child into believing that he is looking at something, and you make the child eat or drink. When it's a student, you don't care. You just take this and then dump this information. The fellow will collapse with the adult that you have no concern, you have no care, you dump the information, the fellow will just collapse. This is what happens. If you have that concern and care, little by little, you will transfer. Very often, we transfer that without any care. If you have that concern and care for a student, are you with me? Will you, uh, just, will you just repeat what I said? If you have that love and concern, you will do that. Can you do anything to facilitate this transfer? Can I do anything to transfer this easily, more easily. Funnel. Yes. Funnel. If this is the teacher, this is the student, the funnel represents your PowerPoint or visual aid. So I'll use this funnel represents visual aid or PowerPoint. I'll use the funnel. So when you use the funnel, what happens? Huh? What is the problem? I have abused the funnel. Very often we abuse PowerPoint. We make a hash of our PowerPoint presentation. What should be used like this? Be used like this. Whatever little was going also will not go. You see the orifice, it has become smaller. Now, whatever little you want to pour also will not go. It is you are making it more difficult. It's as good as keeping it closed only. Now, this is what we do. Very often we abuse PowerPoint and then our presentations become terrible. Our lectures become horrible. When you want to use, nobody is saying you should use, but if you decide to use PowerPoint, make sure you use it properly. Then it will facilitate. I want you to remember, whenever you need to give a lecture, please remember this experiment, even if you have forgotten all that I have said so far. Thank you very much.